I'm happy to introduce our next presenter, and the, our next presenter is Dr. Chris Kaplis. He's the Executive Director of the Center for Transportation Logistics. And uh, Chris is going to be talking about some uh, wisdom that he's distilled or some the recent experience he had from a MOOC that he ran this past fall. And it's been a really rich learning experience. I think he can explain what that really means. An enormous pain in the neck in some cases, but also a big challenge as we're learning about this, uh, this challenge and an opportunity. Um, now, in the past, Chris has served as the executive director of the master's degree program that we grant called the Supply Chain Master's Program. My colleague, Dr. Bruce Arnson, is the executive director of that now. Um, Chris also runs a freight, MIT Freight Lab, which is a research initiative that he started within the, the, the center. And prior to joining MIT, like many of us at the center, he's worked in a number of different operating businesses. And so he brings that freshness and experience to the, the role. So with that, I'd like to introduce Chris Kaplis. Hi, everyone. That was better than what you got this morning. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Chris, and so I know many of you, um, but I, I love Crossroads every year because it's all about disruptions, right? Uh, Professor Sadaway, imagine if that stuff happens. It's a disruption. It might not happen today, tomorrow, but five, 10 years. It can have dramatic changes. Later today, we'll talk about additive manufacturing, which we've done a couple times here, have dramatic breakthroughs. And so this whole idea of an innovator's dilemma where disruption happens and the existing power, you know, the company who's uh, leading the pack in the industry misses it totally. And, um, and so, you know, you see this in the examples of a bunch of different things. Borders, right, gone. Uh, Blockbuster, gone. Kodak, Polaroid, gone. And I don't want to be the next one, right? But here I am working in an industry that has not changed its product for more than 100 years. We lecture in front of people. Hasn't changed. Our cost that we charge you guys, our price, has gone up 146% in real terms, in, in, in you know, evaluate terms since 1984 in 30 years. So an education, the average education of private college right now is about 34,000. In 1984, in 2014 dollars, it was 14,000. So we haven't changed our product. Our price is going way up. And there isn't this new technology, this disruptive technology at the horizon. It isn't, isn't at our front doorstep. It, it's in our living room watching our television, right? The online courses, this thing could totally disrupt us. And so as we see this, MIT and others, and we really took a hard look at this and said, you know, this could cannibalize what we do. So what should we do about it? And so what we did is we stepped back. And when it makes us, when anyone's challenged with this major disruption that's facing them, um, looking at them square on, you try to figure out, you know, what is it that we really do? And so for us, it's easy. We try to educate. We try to teach the world. Because we, we create new knowledge and disseminate. That's all that we do here at CTL, MIT, and any university worth its salt. So the second thing you ask is, why do you do it? And that's kind of, a, you know, why we do it? We want to educate the world. We want to improve the standard of living of everyone, because there's a direct correlation between education, quality of life, longevity, all those kind of things. But the third question, how do you do it? That's the one that we had to focus on, because we knew what we wanted to do and why we were doing it. But the question is, how do you do it? And that's what we really want to talk about today, because the key question, we say, well, how do we do it? You know, how should we teach? That's not even really the right question. Because the right question is, how do you guys learn? How do we all learn as individuals? And that's the question you want to focus on. So if you look at this, any way that any of you learn any task, it's really the simple thing. It happens the same way for everything. Someone explains it to you, whether it's differential equations, uh, tying your shoe, or developing an economic order quantity. Everyone, someone explains something to you, and then what do you do? You practice. You know, you try it, and then you get feedback. Someone tells you, yeah, this worked, you did this wrong, whatever. That's the way you learn. I don't know any other way that people learn, right? You got to try it, because if all you do is listen, you know, you know, until you actually try it, you really don't know it. So how do we do this at any college or any university? Well, this is typically how we explain, right? A room like this, right? A tiered classroom, some guy in the front. Um, this is obviously an old picture, because I don't see a single laptop or phone open up by any of the students, right? Typically, they're checking their emails and everything, playing Flappy Birds. So 
We do an hour and a half lecture twice a week. I've been doing this for 12 years. Others have been doing it for much, much, much longer. Uh, we use PowerPoint slides. That's the big innovation. I don't use blackboards. I don't get chalk as much anymore. Um, questions are encouraged, but as Professor Sadaway said, you know, it's like, you got any questions? And you, know, it's, you encourage it, but you don't. Um, the pace that you set in the classroom, uh, like with any talk, you try to see the nodding heads. And that's the worst thing you can do, because there's always going to be 10% that gets it. And if you follow them, then the other 90% are just lost. right? So you set it to the median as best you can. This is traditional. So how do we practice? We give you homeworks. Right? That's what we do. We give you, say, here's these problems at the end of the two-week lecture or session. We give you a homework that's due in two weeks, because we want to give you time right, to get it done. We grade them individually. You're allowed to ask questions to the teaching assistant during his hours. You don't want to ask him any other time, because he's a student, too. And it's due in a week or two. And the feedback we give you, well, that takes another week or two. Right? So you learned it here. Two weeks later, you get a homework. Two weeks later, you turn it in. Two weeks later, you get feedback. You forgot what you even did. Right? This is the classic teaching uh, methodology. Did anyone have a college experience? Not this. This is what we did. And it's, it's amazing we're still here. Um, so the question we wanted to look at is, what can we do differently? How should we teach? How should we teach? And the same process still works. You, you have to do it this way. But the whole idea is you shrink it. And what you do is, this is an approach called active learning. It's been strong and it's been taking, getting more, uh, stronger and more commonly used across uh, Universities are the last probably 10 years, five to 10 years. And so what you do is you break your 90-minute session into th smaller ones. You explain something quick, you have them do something, then you give them feedback over and over again. So each session is now consists of one, two, three, whatever modules. Makes sense, right? So this is, gives you that quick, rapid feedback instead of waiting three weeks. You make them do it. So it makes sense. Very self-contained. Um, a lot of courses at MIT have done this, and it's very successful for undergrads. Because anyone who's ever been an undergrad, you do your homework or your projects the day before it's due. Right? And so by doing this and forcing students to pay attention every day, the, the uh, pass rate for the, um, it's 1001, the basic programming language in, in civil engineering, pass rate went up to like 80% from close to 60% because it's forcing people to do it. It works at grad school, too. So I converted my courses to this as much as possible, because no one wants to hear me blather on for 90 minutes. So we try to do this. Great new concept. So it's been working. It works very well. Um, but there's a problem. And so to classify this, let's, let's look at what we've done. So when we teach, there's really two different axes. Everything's a two by two, right? So the first is how you deliver it. And so on one end is pure lecture. That's what I'm doing right now. It's a push, total push. I'm pushing out to you. I'm bestowing my knowledge onto you. The other side is the pull, a Socratic method. Has anyone been in a Socratic classroom? Law school does this. Business schools do this. It's where I say very little. I ask you to explain the case. You know, tell me about this. And they have other people talk. You pull the uh, response out of the audience. So that's one axis. The other axis is the format. And that's really whether it's structured or unstructured. And so different ways that you can teach this, uh, teach, fall into one of these four quadrants. And so the first one, the traditional method, is down here. I give a lecture, right? And I have very structured homeworks. Everything's very cut and dry. Been doing this for 100 years. This active learning that we just talked about pushed it up to the upper quadrant, right? Because it's very unstructured. It's Socratic because they're doing projects. They're doing the work right there. And I pull out, and I get, get examples, and you work with them. Does that make sense? So it's a very different, very effective. So then if we look here, just to say, you know, what's up here? Is anything up here where you have a lecture, but it's unstructured? That's called hell, right? We've all been in those classes where the, the clock looks like it's going backwards, you know? It's like it's unstructured. You don't know where it's going. So not, not, you try to stay away from that. What about down here? We have a structured Socratic. It kind of defeats the purpose, right? Because Socratic, you don't know what the students are going to say. So it takes a very good professor to teach a Socratic class. That's why the teachers at uh, Harvard B School are so good, because they're very good at doing that. So this is what we've been doing. And we're very happy moving up here, and everyone's happy. But then what came on the horizon? Online courses. University of Phoenix, Coursera, many other ones are out there. And there's a low-cost technology. And so the question is, where would that go? Where would these online courses go? in the exact opposite of where we've been going. So I've been converting every lecture into something here, very active. 
and now I gotta come down here. It's structured because it's online. You can't change things online when you have thousands of students out there. It's pure lecture because you can't get interaction. So what's interesting is this new disruption, which might disrupt the whole industry, is taking us in an opposite direction that we ever wanted to go. So how do we do this? What did we do? Well, let's talk about MOOCs. Who's never heard of a MOOC before? You all have now. That's awesome. A, a year ago, two years ago, I bet you thought of something Bugs Bunny said, right? You MOOC. Uh, it's not. Um, so let's talk about what the MOOC is, because that's kind of the thing that the whole genesis of this talk. And so the MOOC is, uh, you know, it means whatever you want it to mean. But realistically, it stands for a massive open online course. Um, all, but the M, you know, what is massive? Is 100? We run some MOOCs that have 100 students in it. We run MOOCs that have 10,000, 100,000. I'll talk about the SCX course we ran in the fall that had around 30,000. Um, what is open? Does open mean free? Many think so, usually students. Um, <laughs> does it mean open content? What, what does that mean? Online, that, that seems like it's obvious, but does that mean it's always online? Is it scheduled or is it whenever you want to do it, on demand? Um, is there any real-time interaction? And then, of course, is it self-paced? All these different things. And so the question is, how do you treat this MOOC? Is a relatively new concept, actually. It's only less than a decade old. We'll talk about some earlier versions. But what's cool about working in this area is that no one knows what they're doing. We're figuring it out. And that's, that's so fun. Anyone who worked in a dot-com between 1998 and 2000, it's the same thing. No one knew what they were doing yet. So it's the same thing here. But let me talk about some of the experience that MIT has had doing things like this. Um, start with open courseware. Who has used open courseware in the past? All right. If Bill Gates was in the room, he could raise his hand, right? I learned that this morning. That's how he learned about Sideways course. So let me explain open courseware. About uh, 10 years ago, around 2003, a little over 10 years ago, MIT made an effort to put, uh, the goal was every course online, all the material. Now, online meant the lecture notes, the PowerPoint slides, the syllabus, uh, any course notes, any homeworks, things like that. Um, so my course has been out there for a number of years. Um, and you can see, it, over 10 years, it grew up to more than now. It's been over two, uh, 2 million people have used this. And you don't get credit for it. You don't get certificates. But if you want to learn about something, all the material's there. So it's been kind of successful. But it, it, it reaches a certain point, because you can only learn so much from the flat material. And so what happened is, a couple of years ago, we introduced what's known as MITx. And I'll explain that in a second. But let me explain open courseware. So what it is, you have existing MIT courses. We put our material, they load it, and you can download it for free. Everything's for free for anywhere, assuming you have electricity. Um, it's mostly static, totally free. The single goal was educate the world. That was it, educate the world. What a noble goal, right? Great goal. Broad, easy for faculty. All we did was give our slides, you know, PDFs, and then we're done. No certificate. So now we have MITx. And this is part of what MIT is called the Office for Digital Learning. Anyone who came last year saw Sanjay Sarma talk about some of this. Um, so what's different with this is that we have new content. There's a lot of new courses being developed. We're in the process of developing two new ones that I'll talk about in a second. And they have interactive problems. That's the real difference. Because for open courseware, there was none of that feedback. It was all you know, explanation. There was no problems, right? There's no feedback. So here, we have problems and instant feedback, and I'll talk more about that. There are discussion forums where you get a little feedback from with each other, and I'll talk more about that as well. It's not totally free, it's freemium. Does anyone know what freemium means? Something's free, but then if you want more, you pay a little more. And there's all sorts of models, and, and we're getting much more used to it. Who has played Candy Crush? Oh, you're lying. I see three hands, liars. Who has bought something on Candy Crush? You got to buy that. Oh, yeah, I, I saw you. Yeah, you raise your hand. So the whole idea is maybe it's for free, but if you want an add-on, you can do something. Or if you want something different, you, the base is free, but you do something else and you get revenue from it. Because one thing about open courseware, there's no revenue model. So we're doing it out of the generosity of our heart, which means some other program is subsidizing it, right? So MITx had a multi-pronged goal using this freemium model. We want to supplement residential experience on campus, as well as provide that off or online off-campus education. 
And this is something new, because at MIT, we never use these, because you'd see it in person. Why go to see the notes when you can do it in class? Here, it's a little different. We're looking at this to supplement what's done in the classroom. And it's kind of an interesting thing. I'll talk more about that. And then, again, bring the education to the rest of the world. Educate the rest of the world. It is a ton of more work for faculty. This killed my summer. My wife was a MOOC widow for about three months. My dogs don't recognize me. Um, but it took a lot of work. But it's, it's a platform that you can really grow on. And we'll talk more about that. But it's different from open courseware. So um, sometimes we talk about MITx and edX. MITx, you can think of it as a uh, production house, like Sony Pictures or something like that. They help produce, create all the content along with the professor or the instructors for this movie, for this platform, for this course. edX is like a movie theater. It's like Lowe's, right? L-O-E-W-S, not the, not the hardware store. Um, it's a platform where you go to take, to take this course. So MITx produces it. There's also a HarvardX, a BerkeleyX, all those kind of schools. And in fact, there's a bunch of schools doing this. There's over, these are all the charter members. There's over 100 now member or schools. And they produce courses and content that sit on the edX platform. So if you ever want to do any of these courses, go to edX.org, and you get bombarded with all these different options. So what does a MOOC look like? Um, there's only so many things you can do online, all right? And so first is videos. And so you can have a lot of different videos. So on the top left is uh, me, it's called a talking headshot, right? I really didn't have a big eight ball behind me. It's a green screen. And so yeah, I could have anything I want back there. But I was talking about forecasting, so the eight ball made sense. Um, this is one way to do it. So you're like talking to the audience. You're talking to the person watching it. Because you have to remember, when someone is taking one of these courses, it's probably at night. Their kids are probably in bed, or they're sitting in a dark room somewhere. And so they want to be engaged. And so that's one type of video. You could have also other ones where you're doing something on a blackboard. And that's like Khan Academy. You see that a lot of times. He's very good at that. If you want to see how hard it is, try doing it yourself. Um, or you could show some live action shots. What we did for our first course, um, just because it seemed to make more sense, we did what's known as voice over tablet. So you'd have these slides, and you make them build, very interactive. And I'm talking, and I'd have a pen, and I can circle things and do all that kind of stuff. Seemed to work. Seemed to work. Interestingly, the worst type of video research has shown is someone filming this, and then you watching it, because you feel like a voyeur. And most of us don't like being voyeurs. Right? And so it's one of these things where you're not part of it. Interestingly, the most um, productive, or the most, as they measure you know, who, uh, what helps people retain the most, uh, voice over tablet or like a headshot. Because then it feels like you're talking to the person. But a shot of someone giving a lecture like this, eh, it's not as, uh, not as effective. So you have all these videos. And what's cool is this is the platform. This is what it looks like. It's just a straight screenshot for something. I think I'm doing uh, newsboy problems here. But let me point out some things that are really cool that make it interesting. First is, you can download the video. Um, we only had 600 people in China take this, because our video is streamed over YouTube. YouTube is not the most popular uh, uh, website in uh, China. Um, but you can download and play it in anything you want. You can download the transcript. I thought this was trivial until you get requests from people, because a good 40% of our students, English is not their primary language. And so the other thing that's nice is this. So as I speak, this pops up. And you can see what I'm saying right here. It goes dark. And so you have all of this. And so you have the real live transcript as well. And I found, as I interview different people who've taken this or asked them, this is a huge feature. Because even if you know English pretty well, sometimes when you talk math equations and things, they'd rather read. Because their reading comprehension is usually better than their oral, than their hearing retention. Um, and then my favorite feature is the speed. So I found that most people watch it at 1.25 to 1.5 speed. So I sound like Mickey Mouse, but it goes faster. right? An hour lesson doesn't take as long. And, or you can slow it down. So the beautiful thing about this is, when I'm giving a lecture like this, as much as you would want me to speed up, you can't. You do not have that power. Here you do. And you can pause, and you can go back. And there have been more studies that this is why videos are so powerful for learning, that explanation part. because. Everyone learns at different paces. It's not like the video is going at everyone's pace. It's going at your own individual, as opposed to a lecture where I'm monitoring people nodding heads. So this is videos. That's a, the backbone 
of a course. Almost every course has some kind of video. There's some that don't, but almost everyone does. Then you've got problems. And this is what really differentiates this from just you know, YouTube videos, because you can go on YouTube and find anything. Right? But the question is, does it drive the point home or is it just an explanation? And so we have all sorts of different problems. And what's cool about the edX platform is they're adding new ones all the time. And so this is the standard one that you see where you have multiple choice, the most boring type of question. And so you, you, know, you have multiple choice, uh, which segment to, typically has the smallest variability in terms of coefficient of variation. They pick their answers. They can try it three times, or however many times I want. On the third one, they either get it right or wrong. You can give them hints. You can give them an explanation that pops up. So what am I giving them? Instant feedback. I'm not asking them to do something in two weeks that I'm going to talk about in two weeks. It's instant. So this is the standard easy questions. And we use these kind of interspersed with videos just to make sure they watch the videos. But then you can have more involved questions like this, which I'm sure none of you can read. Um, but it's essentially asking for you've got uh, some transportation that has variable lead time and variable demand, and you're trying to figure out what is the demand over lead time. Right? Standard equation that you do, so you can put in a numerical answer, and I can add it so that I give a, an acceptable range. If it's within 10%, it's OK. Or I can give a hint. If it's really high, I said, oh, you might want to check your numbers again. And at the end of the day, you can check it, and you get the answer, and you get instant feedback, instant solution. Does that make sense? So you can give some quantitative ones. Um, Tricky, and this is where I make all my mistakes, right? Because the math has to be perfect. Because someone in, in India or someone in uh, Kazakhstan will have an issue if they're off by a decimal place and the, their math isn't r right there. But this is another problem type. But then you also have ones like this. Um, this is a drag and drop. So what I would do, these are three different views of a st strategic network. And you guys who've taken my class before should be nodding your head. Right? And so you can drag this up to where the strategic network is and kind of a drag and drop. It's kind of like a multiple choice, but it makes it a little more interesting. They find that if you have a little break things up a little bit, it, uh, it makes it a little more interesting. Again, you give a full answer. Then you have this one, which is fun. Um, it's a picture. And I asked them to point to the gantry cranes. Not, these aren't the most hard questions. I'm not showing you the tough ones. But uh, just to see what they do, and if they go within this box and it's acceptable, whatever. So you have all these different types of questions. You have randomized questions. Uh, you have, for different uh, specific disciplines, you have chemistry building uh, modules. You can build circuits. And we're developing other ones as we go. So the beautiful thing about these MOOCs is that they give instant feedback to problems, and you can monitor them. Not only are they doing this, and they get instant feedback, I get instant feedback. So I see who's doing well and what, and where's a weakness in the, in the class. Does that make sense? All right. So then you've also got forums. So this is where you post something out, and they can talk to each other, kind of. So here's an example. This is what I posted the first week of the class last fall, when it launched in the 30 September, I want to say. And it said, welcome. I'm excited here. I look forward to interacting with you. And you see, you don't see the times now, but within like two minutes, I started getting responses. And so you can't quite see these. Uh, glad to be here, whatever. This is Kishab from India. This is Susha from South Africa, Irene from Spain, uh, Inez from Germany, Lucille from Paris. I mean, this is ridiculous. Within six minutes, you get, you know, what's that, four continents? So it's amazing how quickly they can do this. And they can discuss, they can post things to each other. They can post discussion things. What do you guys think about this? So it's a very powerful tool to get them to feel a sense of community. Because typically for open courseware and a lot of this online stuff, it's very, very lonely. You're just there with your cup of coffee in a dark room at midnight. right? So if you have some discussion, some social aspect, it makes it a little more palatable. There's also a, another thing for it. This is a, another discussion. You can, if they have a question on something, they'll use discussion forums a lot, or to complain, or anything else. So this is a question about uh, pipeline inventory. And they're saying, in video two, I'm not able to understand, blah, 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 blah. Some other guy said, yeah, I don't get it either. Then this other guy, who is a uh, Ramasano, um, says, hey, here's what you need to do, and he answered it. This is awesome, because what does this mean? I don't have to do it. <laughs> right? So they're starting to answer each other's questions, which is we encourage this. Um, it's a great thing to do. And so we see this more often. You know, sometimes it turns into an echo, echo chamber. Oh, I can't get it either. This sucks. I hate this. You know, but I'll, usually someone will solve it, and they'll come in, and they'll thank each other, and move on. 
So it's another, it's a great feature in that it helps them solve their own problems. So that's really all that a, a, a MOOC can be. You can have videos, you can have some kind of interactive problems, and it can have some kind of social discussion. That's really it. You might have a simulation, but that's the same thing. It's a kind of like a problem. Um, so what do we do for CTL SCX? Well, we were asked by Sanjay about a year, just about a year ago, to say, to come up with a certificate course. So what uh, MIT is doing, it's offering a three course X series certificate. They have one for electrical engineering and we're gonna be the second one in supply chain management. The idea is if you take these three courses, right? Three is the magic number, I don't know why. Um, then you get this other certificate. Because people are, it's not a degree, but people want to be certified. They want credentialization. So what we did is we're creating three online courses and when you finish you get this X series. Uh, the question we faced though is we looked at this and said, how do you structure it? Because supply chain is either a massive topic or a tiny topic, depending on who you talk to, right? And so one way we could do it, which um, we were originally suggested to do, is to do it functionally. You do a whole session on forecasting, right? Top to bottom. Then you do something on inventory management. Then you do something on transportation. And we said, yeah, but that's boring. And supply chain is not a function anymore. It's really across. So we said, well, what if we do it this way? We do one that's just fundamentals. Something you need to know. We touch a little bit of each at the basic level. Then the next one, you go a little higher. You go into design. How do I design my forecasting, my SNOP system, my CPFR system? How do I design my inventory, my flow, my physical flow, whether it's a network design or anything else? And my transportation, how do I design that? And then strategy, how do I tie each of these into the larger company's goals? So we had two different ways we could do it, and there might be other ones. We decided to go with this one, because it, it has one negative, right? For this one, it doesn't matter what order you go, right? If you do transportation before inventory, before forecasting. Here it kind of implies tough to do design where you don't know the fundamentals. So it naturally inhibits the amount of people we're gonna have in the follow-on courses. But we took that uh, challenge, and so we designed it this way. And so we have three courses, SC1X, SC2X, and SC3X, very clever names. Um, but it's the first time since 19, 1985, I wanna say, where we had a CTL dot course at MIT. We used to have it back in the heyday, the CTS, Center for Transportation Studies, but we haven't had one for a long time because we're part of engineering systems. So this was one of the first CTL dot courses and there'll be more of these. So the first one is all about fundamentals. We launched it last fall. I'll talk more about this in a few minutes. We're gonna launch it again this summer and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, so this is the fundamentals. We go into basic time series, exponential smoothing and forecasting, inventory models, you can guess it, EOQ to Newsboy to continuous or periodic review, um, levels of service, how they all tie together, transportation, mode choice, route choice, variability, local routing. That's pretty much it. It's almost a mirror of what we do here. We've been doing at campus for 20 years in ESD 260 or 1.260 logistic systems. It's almost a mirror with a couple things taken out. The next one, which will go in the fall of 2015, is design. And we look at the flow, the design of the physical, financial, and information flows of a supply chain. The financial systems, as well as the organization and the metrics. Um, how do you collaborate with partners on the, the buy side, the production side, and the demand side? And so how do those things all tie together? And then we'll finish up with SC3X, where we talk about strategy. And it's really all about how does this fit into the bigger picture? And we're gonna introduce a little bit of strategy and how things tie together, tied to our SC2020 project, which has been going on, started under Larry Lapidi, then Dr. Mahender Singh, and now run by Dr. Roberto Perez Franco. And so it's gonna tie a lot of that together. And so the idea is that people will take each of these, hopefully in sequence, but they don't have to, and they'll end up with a certificate. So that's what we had planned, and we're still, this one's baked, this one is baking, um, but any input that people have, I'd love to talk to you. This one is still pretty open, and what we wanna do here is have case studies, more case studies, and we don't know how we're gonna do it yet, but that's half the fun. And so we're looking for different companies to highlight a problem that you had, and we can see it being a video interview and maybe posing a problem and thinking of a way where they can come in and provide an answer, get some insight, and give them feedback. So this one's pretty baked. This one's getting there, but I'd love to get more input from you guys. Here, this one, we're figuring it out. Because typically, this is taught in a Socratic method. Right? You give a case study and you say, what, what happened in this case? What do you think? Hard to do with a MOOC. But we're gonna try and figure that out. 
All right, so this is what it looks like. If anyone's been online, they all pretty much look like this on edX. Let me navigate you. Every week is on the left, so you can see week one, two, three, four, and it's over a different topic. If you break open a week, you see that there's a certain structure to it. Every week has some video. It's usually me just waving and saying, hi, this is what we're going to do this week, usually with an eight ball or something behind me. Um, lesson one, we have two video sections that consist of a series of videos. This ribbon tells you what's there. It's a video, then a problem set, a video, then a problem, then a video, then a problem, so on. It's a kind of navigation. But what we try to do is each week has the exact same structure. You see an intro, you find out what you're going to be talking about. You have about an hour's worth of video interspersed with little sections, an hour total with questions interspersed. You do two of those. Then you have a bunch of practice problems that'll turn into a whole library. And then you have some graded problems. That's the only thing that we did for a grade. So this was the structure that we did. And you can see here, you got that video I already showed you. And you got the different ways you can download things for the slides because we're trying to provide as much information as possible for how people learn. So let's talk about SC1X. This is the fall course. So we opened the registration. Registration was open, because all edX courses, or most edX courses, they um, operate, they open and they close. They get on a release schedule. They're not on demand. Why? Because we want to have that community, the discussion. You, if it's an on-demand course, then people are at all different stages. There is no community. It's very hard. So we, we release it on time. So early June, and we had 20,000 people registered by the time the course opened on the end of September. The first week, we got another 4,000, right? Because uh, they started pushing it and say, oh, it's happening now. So you get on. Interestingly, over the course of the course, and it was 11 weeks, um, we added 4,000 more students. Now, after this point, they couldn't earn it for credit, for a certificate, because they've missed too much of the previous course. So there's probably 5,000 or two to 3,000 on here that, yeah, they were registered, but they couldn't do anything. And more interesting, once the course ended, we keep having that. I, I, I can't keep them away. Um, so the course is archived. The graded assignments are hidden. Um, but we're getting about 250 to 300 a week that are registering, which is awesome um, and depressing because what the original plan was that we would run this again in 12 months. And they said, oh, i got to wait 12 months. And they're all excited. So we, we made a, a, a change, and we're going to actually relaunch this in the summer and do two in the fall uh, because there's, there's some pent up latent demand. So this is what the registration looked like. So 30,000 roughly at the end of the course or 32 now. Um, where'd they come from? So the number one country was the US, about 20% of everyone. Number two, India was about 12%. And then Brazil, that was about uh, 4%. And then you can see the shades of, of gray as it gets uh, lighter, it's a lower number, but let's look at it by continent, which is always fun. Um, because I know I'm talking about fairy tales here, because no one in Africa does online courses. Um, you can see there was about 2,600 of them there. Um, you can see it's, this includes India, so about 6,000 up in the Central Asia, Middle East about 1,700, big numbers in Europe and North America, Mexico and the Caribbean, Central America really was quite big, Latin America very strong, got to talk to Australia, they're lagging a little bit. Um, but you can see it's everywhere. People are doing this, taking this course. And so we can look at where the big numbers came from, but what was really fascinating, 186 countries, by the way, 186 countries. And so as I was classifying them to continent, I came across, I had no idea where they were. So we have two people in the Republic of Cabo Verde who took the course. Where is, where is that? Does anyone know? Right about uh, here? It was a little lower. Yeah, so we're in there. How about Burkina Faso? You know, it's right, it's this one. Whoops, whoops, right up here. Landlocked. 10 million people. Who knew? I didn't know. Um, but you see it's all over. There's uh, one person in the Falkland Islands, two from Greenland. Um, you know, so it's interesting to see where they come from and the parties of one taking this. Now, did they all complete the course? That's a different story. It's a different uh, way. But just the interest is out there. So for you guys, good news. A lot of interest in supply chain. If you have a supply chain talent challenge, they're out there. People want to learn. So there is a pool. So some other, th some other demographics, this is age. Uh, the median age was 30, predominantly male, 75%, kind of like the audience, right? We are a male-dominated industry still. 30% um, were less than 25. 
uh, 57 or 60 percent was between 26 and 40, and there's some that are over 40. And there was my dad. He took the course. <laughs> He's 83. I, I always knew he was an outlier. I just didn't know why. And I think there was some lying here. I don't think we had any two-year-old prodigies. But you know, it's all self-reported data. Um, but it could be. could be. You never know. But you can see the age distribution. It's very Poisson, right? Very nice. Has a long tail, which is interesting. Um, Education-wise, you don't see too many people from high school taking it. It's predominantly people who had mat uh, a bachelor's degree or a master's. I did see a, a lot of population of people that were usually older males with master's or higher degrees who took this as entertainment or edutainment. They're out there. there I had one guy who sent me a note, and he complained. He said he was talking about something he didn't like about the course, and he said, in, in the 40 to 50 MOOCs I've taken so far, and I stopped reading. It's like, you, 40 to 50? Oh my gosh, what are you doing? Come up from the basement. Um, but, but there's a lot there, and so the, this raises the question, is that our audience? Who's our audience? And so it's, it's a challenge. It's a question we have to look at. Um, so what'd they do? We had a bunch of people sign up from uh, different ages, and so what this shows, this is from the, the site itself. Let me explain it. This is the number of students. You see 10,000, 8,000, whatever. The blue means they're active. Active means they went on and did something. Right? So we started with about 12,000. And you can see over the course of the weeks, this is when we ended. Right? You can see it got declining. And I'll explain some of this in a second. The, the greenish line is if they watched a video. And trying problems is that orangish line. And you can see a general decline. We expected this. And you see, remember I said 30,000? Only a third actually did something. Some people were just excited. And like my dad, didn't do a single problem. <laughs> and so let's, let's go through. So here's registration, right? We started week zero, rather, first week of class. Um, the sudden drop was because math came in the second week. Anyone who took the course, you know, the first week was, hey, supply chain, we're fun. And then we start doing math. <laughs> and that's why you see the sudden drop. You see another drop here, because the way I set up the, the points, Every week counted equally, 10 weeks, 10% each. You need a 60% to pass, because this is only pass-fail. That's all that we do here. So really good students, after six weeks, what did they do? They stopped, right? And so we saw a drop. People in weeks six, seven, eight, nine, I got 60%, I'm out of here. They're going to take some, do another MOOC. Um, but we, and I'll explain some of those other things. So a lot of people dropped out. A learning for us, a learning for us. So we ended. We gave out 2,200 certificates. 2,200 certificates. Putting that into perspective, my class is usually 70 to 80 students. That's 28 years worth of teaching at MIT. And it is virtually identical problems. In fact, on some of the ones this year, what I gave online, I gave as a midterm and a final for this class. And I won't talk about who did better. Um, but uh, it's massive. So forget that we you know, went from 30,000 just to two. 2,000 students. I mean, that's amazing. So you can hit a lot of people. Uh, what did they do? This shows how well they did. And let me explain this really quickly. Number of weeks that they submitted something. So some people did nothing, 84%. So in any MOOC, this happens. You're going to have a huge fall off. People sound interested. Oh, this sounds like a great course until you have to do something. And then they forget about it. But of those who went forward, you know, 3% only did one week, 2% did two weeks. You see how it reads? And so people who did all 10 weeks, the average is 84% across all the, all the homeworks. So that's pretty good. That's about a B. You know, you aim for that in the class. Um, and you see the nines and the eights, and there's some people here that passed up to seven weeks because you got to drop a week as well. But you can see that people did fairly well. And the interesting thing now, though, is we're getting, you know, 250 to 500 students are still engaged. They're not new ones signing up. I said that's about 250 a week. 500 a week are doing something. Lord knows why. They're not getting a certificate. They're just doing it. So people are watching uh, videos, right? That's right around 500 a week. It's steady since the course closed. This is why we're relaunching it, because we want to generate on this, grab this momentum, and continue on and get a bunch of new students that can then take SC2X in the fall. OK, so what did we learn from this? MIT, what, uh, me, personally. Um, this helped me crystallize the way I view education. And I, I really, I'm, I'm very happy with this uh, pers perspective. It was an epiphany to me. 
First is we educate the world for free. That's my mission. That's my mission in life, my goal here at MIT. Everyone, if you want to learn something, I will educate you for free. That's what the MOOC enabled that we never were able to do before. However, if you want to get credentialized, if you want me to sign something and say, hey, you learned something, you got to cover my costs. So I credentialize a cost. If you want something customized and specialized, then we do that at margin, right? But to me, this, this crystallized the way that I approach education because education is the number one driver of increased wealth and all those other things. So give it for free, that's our mission. But credentializing, which is what a lot of people want, you gotta pay for that. Unfortunately, the way that edX is set up right now, you can get an honor certificate for free. You can pay $100 to get a, a verified certificate. And for that, you have to show your picture with an ID card occasionally. The difference between them, you get a PDF at the end, one is signed, one is not. So no one knows. So we're trying to move to this platform where you credentialize at a cost, but educate for free. Does that make sense? It's a big mission. This, this is the, my big, big takeaway. Um, we also have no single education method works, all universally. So we've been teaching here in standard lecture, kind of action learning format, like I described earlier, for the last five years or so. And so this fall, when I launched this course, I had students come up to me and say, hey, can we get the videos? And I'm going, you got me live. You're the luckiest people in the world. You don't have to watch a video. You can come here every Monday and Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning and see me live. <laughs> and they said, yeah, that's great. Can we get the videos? <laughs> so what I found is just by, well, they can't stop me in class. They try, but they can't stop me in class or go forward or speed me up or slow me down. So it's kind of a reinforcing because they were exact, very similar lectures. And so we're finding that even ones here are using it. Um, traditional lectures are the least effective method. I've been talking for 46 minutes. Chances are if we did a test on retention, you'd only remember the first 15, right? That's just the way it is, but we give 90 minute lectures still. So the traditional lecture is the worst. However, in pieces, it's a very effective way to get an idea across. Um, online courses are good for other things, right? But not for everything. It's hard to get that face-to-face -face time or that open discussion because it has to be so structured. There is no way of correcting something midstream. Once a video is out there, it's out there. You can't adjust it. In class, you can adjust. You have no flexibility. And so what it really means, you need this portfolio. And so what Yossi, Sheffy, and I, who uh, teach this course in the fall, we're combining them this fall. And we don't know how we're going to do it yet, but that's fun. And then we're trying to combine these methods, because some things work well in others, and some methods work well for other techniques. Um, running a course is non-trivial. It's equivalent to writing a book, I've been told. Um, creating lessons in a vacuum, I'm in a dark room with headphones, trying to sound excited, right? Because someone's going to be watching this, you got to sound excited. It's hard, and you know there's no corrections. Once the video's out there, you, can't, you can edit it then, but once it's launched, it's launched. You can't correct yourself later on. Um, online students require lots of attention and care. You need to put a lot of room, and, and if you have, in your programs, in your companies, if you have programs, you need to have someone there to interact with them, because if not, their attention will drop and their retention will drop. So what you need to do is get them discussing and be very responsive to their needs. The other big challenge is finding, making it economically sustainable. That's a challenge, because aspirations doing everything for free, that works so long until the money runs out, right? And so you've got to try to find something um, econom economically sustainable. So what's in it for you guys? So I think the big lesson is the good news, you have new methods now for training. You guys have big training budgets. Most companies who's represented here today, they train uh, their, their uh, workforce for retention, for education to advance them, because it's always better to train an existing employee than bring in someone new, right? And so you have a huge budget probably. There are now new tools in your tool belt. Um, you're able to deliver consistent lessons. Instead of giving something out that you don't know how it's delivered locally, it's centralized. So you can give the content out and have local customization. You can do it over uh, your wide, uh, workforce, and it's low delivery cost. Once it's made, it's really trivial. It's YouTube. It's an easy platform. Creating, not so much. That's a little harder. Some bad news is it's not suited for all learnings. Face-to-face -face matters. It really does matter. That's why I don't see MIT going away anytime soon. Um, but schools that deliver basic kind of things, they're challenged now. Because if everything you do can be taught in a video and then done with the multiple choice, you might want to find a new profession, right? So it challenges that. 
Uh, and its ability to control, another challenge is the ability to control for collaborating uh, amongst uh, people taking the course. We like to call that cheating. Um, it's hard, because they're all remote. And so apparently there was a shadow Facebook page created for the course. And people were doing it, and I purposely stayed away because I hate Facebook. Um, but people were doing, they were sharing, and so how do you control that? That's a challenge. And the general lesson that I started this whole thing with is the whole idea of a disruption. So when we saw a disruption, um, and we weren't the first ones to do this, but we have a whole s network of centers. We have one in Bogota, right, the Center for Latin American uh, Logistics Innovation. We have one in uh, Europe, in Zaragoza, the Zaragoza Logistics Center. We have one in Southeast Asia, in Shah Alam, or right side of Kuala Lumpur, the Malaysia Institute for Supply Chain Innovation. So we have 130 graduate students out there. We're probably opening more centers in the next 18 months. So why am I doing something that I educate for free if we're trying to populate these centers? So it's a challenge to come up with this disruption. And we could have said, no, we're going to stay away from this. We're going to stay away, but we embraced it. And we're trying to figure out now how to make it work. Because we can scale it, but the question is, how do we make it sustainable? And we're already going to incorporate these into all the different centers we have. But it's not, it wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't an easy decision. And with that, I'll close it. And uh, what questions do you have? Who wants to offer the first question? Way in the back. Here you go. Excuse me. So just say who you are and where you're from. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kaplis. Uh, my name is Charles Rapu. I'm from B2W, Brazilian company. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. I had a question um, regarding what do you think are the best practices for companies to use MOOCs as a way to, to you know, uh, train their people? And have you, have you heard of any good, good recommendations? I know one good supply chain one. <laughs> no, there, there's, I think you have to pick what you want them to learn. I don't think anyone's going to learn how to work on a team with a MOOC. But there's certain, uh, I think the more hardcore and structured the problem is, the more it's suited to be taught by a MOOC. So that would be all the basic uh, calculations, analysis, um, new techniques. You could learn lean manufacturing. You can get some of those concepts, statistics. That's well suited for that, because you try it on your own pace, you practice, you learn, you learn. If there's other tasks that are more team oriented, those I think are less well suited. So you have to really determine what do you want to do. As someone moves up, I could see this as complementing um, a certain level. But as you get higher in an organization, you probably want more training on interpersonal skills. And interpersonal skills are tough to teach on an online course. Yes. Hi, Muffy Fulton from Genentech. I had a question. When the course was running and you had those 2,000 active students, how much time and effort is it for you or anyone else like answering those questions when they're not getting answered by other people, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Too. Too much time. No. <laughs> No, it, um, so one of the big lessons I didn't write up here that I learned is I understaffed that element, and that was a, a common source of irritation to the students. It usually, the way that they uh, post it is usually a full-time TA or a half-time TA, so that's anywhere from 10 hours a week monitoring that. Um, we're on the larger end of the MOOCs that were here at MITx. There's other Sorry. ones. Um, 6001, the electrical engineering one, was 100,000 the first time it ran, right? But that's the exception. Most are in the five to tens. So we're a little higher than I thought, and they, I didn't think they'd be as needy as they were. So what it really takes is someone to look a couple hours every day. One of the other problem is that we tended to staff, and we all do this, like heroes. So I'd wait till Friday, and then I'd spend 12 hours answering everyone's questions, and then go sleep, right? Then come back next Friday and answer 12 more hours. That's horrible. You have to do a little bit every day, a little bit every day to keep them going. Because if someone doesn't get an answer quickly, it starts festering. And then you get that echo chamber, right? And someone says, oh, from Sweden says, I didn't get it either. And, someone, and then pretty soon you have a rebellion on your hand. So keeping a steady state constant um, and doing it as a triage. So you have some people on the front line that are just, because a lot of people say, hey, I'm happy to be here. I'm from Spain. It's like, great. And you move them off. But the ones have a problem, they triage and go to the next person who can help them. And so that's what we're in instituting now. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, OK. There we go. Thanks. So uh, my question is, what's your um, base level production value of how you're creating your videos? I mean, do you have a whole team that's dedicated to videoing you? And what do you have a 
production room? Or are you doing this from your office desk? How are you? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, MITx has a team, and they assign for every course that gets approved. They have a team as a lead vi video person, a lead to technology or problem, kind of the background plumbing, and then a lead program manager. And so, yes, there are a lot of facilities that they can do. Um, it ended up, everything we did, we did on a Surface, and I'm a Mac guy, and the Surface is a little bit of a challenge going backwards. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a nice piece of equipment, and so we used that, and everything was captured there with video. And so I would do my recording myself. Um, you never realize how loud a room is until you're recording it. And afterwards, you hear the radiator go. There was one room I was recording, and the fluorescent lights hummed. And I didn't realize until like 30 minutes in. And so those kind of things. So there is, MIT does have facilities here. There is professional um, video that you can do. And some of it is also done on our own. The big thing is once you tape it, um, there's more than that. They also have to transcribe it. Everything to, to satisfy ADA, American with Disabilities Act. So everything has to be um, transcribed, live uh, transcription. So it takes, a, there's a, that's the most labor intensive process that you can't change. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. You talked a, a little bit about, oh, I'm sorry, David Walsh from uh, Barry Plastics. But you talked a little bit about this, but did you have a preconceived notion of who these students were going to be for this? And then were you then surprised by the data? And then going forward, do you have any plans to try and shape the demographics in terms of how, you, how this is marketed or how you push it? Or are you just going to kind of put the content out there and see who's interested? Yeah, I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I figured it would be most people interested in education. I, I, I was not surprised by everyone had a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, and then male didn't surprise me. The average age is a little older than I thought. I thought it'd be a little younger. But we're, there is a long tail and I, that I underestimated that edutainment segment of the crowd. Um, and what are we doing going forward? My ideal is anyone who wants to learn, bring them on, anything. The, the other problem we had is I didn't show it. Uh, people started complaining that there was math in the course. I need to do a better job of weeding them out. D don't even set their expectations. Um, one of the courses here at MITx was with robotics. And they made the mistake of having a nice fuzzy robot on their registration page. And they had 9,000 peop people sign up until they realized it was a real programming course. And I think 130 graduated. Right? Because all of a sudden it's like, oh, this isn't robots. <laughs> you know? So I have to do a better job at making sure people are qualified. You have to be this high to do this, or else you'd be severely disappointed. Um, we are shaping it because I want to guide people and sent them to go to the uh, verified certificate. Because I want to credentialize. If you want to get cred credentialized, we got to cover some costs, because that takes more time. And so we are incentivizing adding some more content, additional problems to the ver that's only visible to the verified people. But we're keeping everything. If you want to learn it, it's all there. If you want to get certified and get a little extra component, extra mater supplemental material, that requires a verified certificate. So I'm trying to push people in that direction to try to make it so it's sustainable so we can keep doing this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Hey, Chris. Uh, my name is Alessandro. Um, first of all, just to, uh, congratulations. I have uh, performed the first course. And okay. I know all of your dogs, all of your lessons you end with a dog like that. And uh, I have spent quite of my weekends um, practicing and trying to develop tools How, how'd you on do? your course. Uh, I was among the 3%. I, I ended right. up with the 89%. Oh, I forgot to say, so let, me, let me just interrupt. So out of the 30,000, right, and 2,000 finished and got certificates, three people got perfect 100s, 10 weeks. Every, everything, 100, nothing wrong. And one from Peru, one from the Netherlands, and one from China. So Americans, we're, we're, we're lagging. <laughs> we're lagging. But yes, go on. Yeah, and, and, and it was quite interesting because even senior management at the sea level of my company enrolled, and they couldn't keep up with the pace. You know, you know that's what uh, happens. You get higher levels. You, you start losing <laughs> the brain cells. So, yeah. So yeah. just a suggestion as well. I think that the, moving forward for the sheeting part as a suggestion, uh, maybe if you guys release the grade just by the date that uh, it is really do the exercise or the graded testing, that would be an option, maybe with two answers, just as a recommendation. Oh, and my you. question is, um, what, why the, the, the course that will be now at the spring, the design w was moved to the fall? Was that because of the low, um, only 2,000 people that they com completed the, the first one? And the second <laughs> question is, um, how does it change from the first one to the second? Is it okay. worth to redo um, 
new concepts are are going to come to the structure. Yeah. Okay. So the first question, we moved it uh, for one main reason because we were ready, almost ready to launch. It would be a little bit of a push. We're going to launch it in uh, May, but then what happened is. Uh, MITx is trying to decide how do we make this economically sustainable, and we started exploring different methods, and that took some time to figure that out. Uh, we made the decision about two weeks ago to offer the one course again in the summer, and it's mainly because we have a backlog of about 6,000 people already registered who want to take it. And so instead of launching two, the second course, and then making these people wait a year, we said, we'll just push it to the fall. That was the real reason, because we had this backed up demand. What will be different? Um, we thought we'd fix some of the mistakes, right? So any of the errors and the problems we're going through and fixing those. We found that people wanted something to read. Uh, we failed at that. We didn't give them a book, a, a PDF, a description. We had slides and videos, but they also want like a, a cheat sheet at the end. I don't mean like a sheet to cheat on, but something that summarizes the concepts. So we're creating that. No new concepts, no new videos are being created. Um, the grading assignments will change a little bit, but the same concept. So if you've already taken it and you passed, no, don't bother. You can go and look at it and you know, get some of these uh, sheets and everything, but you don't need to retake it. If you took it as an honor certificate, though, free, and you want to get one of these X-series certificates, you got to take it. I can't flip you from honor to verified. You got to take it again. Does that answer your questions? And the, the other thing about timing, the challenge for that is, uh, what I, well, another thing I discovered, somewhere in the world, someone is on vacation at all times. So I had people saying, oh, we can't, uh, Europe says, well, you can't have a course in the summer. We're gone in July and August. It's like, you must, must be nice. Um, so we always have these courses. It's going to interrupt someone somewhere. But we are trying to give more time. We have two more questions. Okay. First one's from Aaron, and then Samir. Hey, Chris. This Hi, is uh, Aaron Baker from Damco. Um, a question about the number of questions that you get. Uh, have you ever thought about or done anything in, in terms of incentivizing people who get the right answer, like a call out from the professor or some sort of incentive credit? That, that's a really good idea. I didn't do that. Um, I, I did, let me think. No, I, I did some. And so I called out people who answered. They said, hey, thanks for doing that. I did some of that, not as much as I should. Because I think that stuff, even if you're not being called out, it incentivizes other people seeing that. And you're, you're right. One of the big things that makes it more personal is to be more personal in how you respond and make sure everything doesn't sound like it comes from a robot. And so that's one thing that we should probably do more of. It's a great idea. Hi, uh, Patrick Billon, Cabot Corporation. Uh, great presentation and a great course. I, I took it too. How'd you do? I passed, finished, Woo! like you did, till the end. Uh, you talked about educating the world for free. Yes. Uh, to get the credential, you need to pay a minimum of $100. I was wondering, in terms of demographics, uh, how does this work throughout the world? What are people ready to pay for getting this credential? It's an excellent question. I, I don't have that data. Um, edX is very, you may not believe this, but we're a very political academic environment. And I do not have access to the list of names of people who took verified or took honor. I have all their grades, but I don't know whether how they registered. So I can't do that analysis. From anecdotal, I know the people who had the most challenges were from Africa. And so I remember I had a long email exchange with a guy um, in the beginning because he couldn't figure out how to pay. He says, I don't have a credit card. You have to use a credit card. So finally, he had relatives in the United States. He talked to them, wired them money. They used the credit card, and he got registered. I mean, people went to great lengths, which is humbling um, for this. And what $100, people were saying, well, that's $100. That means, do I get APIC certified, right? Do I get the CSC and P certification, or do I get what, what you're doing? Because $100 is $100. I can only spend it once. Well, here in North America, uh, people I talk to today say, oh, it's just 100 bucks. So it's tough to figure that out, because we have to have one universal price. I don't know the best way to do that. We're still figuring that out. But one educating for free, always, always. Credentializing, got to get something. One last question. Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, Samir Savant here from Ryder. Uh, question is, are you uh, thinking of going the uh, Georgia Tech way and introducing like a full... We never follow Georgia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm from Georgia Tech. No, I'm from Georgia Tech. But are you, are you ever thinking of going that route and creating like a uh, master's program and like they're doing with a MOOC in uh, computer science? Um, I can't speak for MIT, as Sanjay and those guys who are doing this. Um, I would say it's a very low probability. Um, MIT believes strongly 
that there is, to get a degree, you need to be on residence because there's something about being here. There's something about having a face-to-face -face in discussions, maybe not with the content, but with the side peer-to-peer. -peer. So I, I don't, uh, I'm not privy to some of the discussions that uh, Raphael Reif and those guys have, but I see a very, very, very low probability. In fact, the programs, as opposed to Georgia Tech, that we have in, in all our centers, they do not get an MIT degree at the ones in Zaragoza or uh, um, the Southeast Asia or in Latin America. They don't get degrees. They get a certificate. So degrees are only granted if you're here. So I, I don't think so. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>